Hey, good morning, everybody. Happy Tuesday to you. Uh, this week's edition of Training Tuesday, we actually have a lot of information to go over. <clears throat> so, um, hope you've had your coffee or your tea, or if you are um, unlike me and abstain from the caffeine, um, good luck. Uh, we have a lot of information to get to. Uh, I know I'm kind of I'm kind of joking, but you missed uh, or you may have seen the three CPO notices that came out yesterday. We're going to walk through each one of them. Um, this is one of those few bid by trainings as well that uh, we I, I'm not going to be able to go down and do the the what ifs or rabbit holes or um, uh, questions. So this is really what we want everybody to do is read through. Um, read through the CPO notices, read through them once, read through them twice, you know, to quote Lionel Richie, right? The once, twice, three times a lady. I'm not going to torture you guys by singing to you, but um, collect your questions as we're going through them. I'm just not going to be able to um, answer and keep track of the chat just because really there's so much information to get through today. Um, and as you collect your questions, you can reach out to me and or your SPO. And uh, this is all new information regarding um, new changes in law. So um, we're kind of uh, rolling with it. And as procurement people, this isn't the first time that laws have changed and we change processes and add forms and update forms and all that sort of stuff. So while this is a lot of information that we're about ready to go through, just know that um, we're gonna get through it together. We're gonna figure out all your questions. We're gonna answer all your questions in due time as they arise. Um, and you can always reach out to me and or your SPO. Okay, so let's just jump right on in. The first one is CPO notice 23 or 2023.08. And just as a reminder, I put on here um, how we find our CPO notices. So you go to the CPO GS website, you click on the procurement resource library at the bottom of the screen, then you click on CPO notices. So our first one is the CPO notice 2023.08 which is the changes to the uh, Procurement of Domestic Products Act. Okay, so let me, I'm gonna jump out here and go to our CPO notice. Okay, 2023.08. So I am going to do a little bit of reading for you. Not all, I'm not gonna read all of it, but at the same point, this is really important for us to be able to go through. So Public Act 102.721 amended the Procurement of Domestic Products Act, making it the public policy of the state of Illinois regarding um, putting in the uh, requiring agencies to promote the purchase and give preference to manufactured articles, materials, and supplies that have been manufactured in the United States. Okay, so beginning for those solicitations. So this is specific to IFBs and RFPs, okay? So beginning March 1st, so that's our a really key and important date. The IFB and RFP templates have been updated and have been posted this morning out there. And we're gonna walk through some of the changes in the IFB and RFP templates. Um, but this is a new solicitation term. Um, this is a change in law. So this is a preference that vendors can claim as a part of their their bid or offer now just up front we're mostly going to see this on ifbs technically it does apply to rfps but i'm not sure how that where that's really gonna um it's gonna be much much less common so for our ifbs is where really we're going to be focused on so the following instructions shall be included in agent agency procurements conducted by ifb or rfp um, and those like i said those templates this has already been updated so as long as you're using the new templates, um, you'll you'll be fine. And so, walking through this is the uh, the instruction that is there. Um, it's the policy, and you talked about the um, the Domestic Products Act. Um, if this procurement is for a product alone and does not include a service, then preference shall be given to a product manufactured in the United States. And so, that's really important. So, as we, as we start to to dive into this, just keep this in the back of your mind that this is specific to those IFBs, RFPs, that it's for a product alone. It has no service component. If it has a service component involved, right, you, um, there is, uh, 
training involved with it, if there is any sort of service component in, in, involved, and that's its own kind of another conversation that we'll that we'll be discussing. Um, if it does include any service component, the preference will not apply to that procurement. So if you think about a lot of IFBs, there is some service component involved. So I just want to throw that out there at the beginning before we dig into this and we we start thinking, um, oh, wow, how, how is this going to affect all, all, of, all of my IFB procurements? Okay, so a vendor must affirmatively declare at the time they submit the bid, and we're going to walk through the process and the instructions that are in the IFB template um, for the what, how, how a vendor is going to declare their preference. Um, they must declare at the time they submit the bid or the offer uh, that the product being proposed to the state is manufactured in the United States. Now, the agency may request documentation verifying the product's manufacturing origin. The purchasing agency shall purchase the product manufactured in the United States unless they determine any of these following applies. So here is the other kind of exceptions. The procured product is not manufactured in the United States in reasonably available quantities. Uh, number two, the price of the procured product manufactured in the United States exceeds the price of, of available and comparable procured products manufactured outside the United States by 12% or more. So we're going to come back to that 12%. That's really important because the, the preference, you know, when they're claiming a preference, the price preference that a vendor who is um, proposing uh, and submitting products manufactured in the United States, they're going to have a 12% price preference. Okay, that's going to be that's going to be our key number here um, in, in terms of what that preference is. The quality of the procured product manufactured in the United States is substantially less than the quality of the comparably priced available and comparable pro procured products manufactured outside the United States. Or the purchase of the procured products manufactured outside the United States better serves the public interest by helping to protect or save life, property, or the environment. The purchase of the procured product is made in conjunction with contracts or offerings of telecommunications, fire suppression, security systems, communication services, internet services, information services. So these are all exceptions where the preference will not apply. Okay, so I, I know I'm reading through these, but as you read through this once, twice, three times, these scenarios are the are the exceptions where the that 12% um, or where the price preference will not apply. Okay, or also the purchase of pharmaceutical drugs uh, products or pharmaceutical products, excuse me, drugs, biologics, vaccines, medical devices used to provide medical or health care or treat disease or used in medical or research diagnostic tests and medical nutritionals regulated by the FDA under the Federal uh, Food, Drug and Cosmetic Act. Okay. So this is not going to apply to sole sources or emergencies or small purchases, right? This is very specific to IFBs um, and much, much less common RFPs. So those IFBs where there is no service component, right? You're just getting a, getting a, a product uh, to you, but has no service component at all. Okay. So again, I know I, we're going to have a lot of questions as this comes, comes into play. How do we how do we implement this? How's it going to work? Uh, document those questions as we're going through, and and we'll make sure that they they get answered. Okay, so the evaluation piece of this. So let's say that a in an IFB where uh, one or more items are being procured, and the act applies to each line item. So that's important as well. So if um, it, it it's important, it's always important to tell our vendor community how this procurement is going to be awarded. Is it going to be awarded um, by line item? So low cost for each line item, or is it going to be uh, awarded the, the, the total cost that that comes into play and is even going to shine a little bit more light um, in these scenarios where a preference might be claimed. Okay, so in where the. Um, it's where the items are being independently evaluated and awarded separately. You calculate whether the US products price is 12% or more than the non US product. Um, multiply the non US products price by 1.12. So there's going to there's going to be a little bit of um, outside. Uh, the, the bid by system is not going to automatically uh, bring in this price preference. Okay, so in in, in the instances where a. Uh, domestic product preference is being claimed. 
you will have to um, kind of do that math outside of the system. Okay. Um, it's all going to be documented as a part of the award on the notice of award as well. Um, but it's not going to be as clean cut within the bid by system as it currently is when you can go in there and you can automatically see who the low price is. So, let's say um, we have an example here. Um, if, if, if a vendor is going to the, the total or the award is going to the total cost of the combined items. The 12% price preference will not apply to a bidder that pros proposes a mix. So the bidder has to propose all products, all, all of them have to be US products. So if you have five line items and the bidder, you know, claims the preference for four of them, but you're awarding based on the entire uh, combination of the, of the total of the combined items, that price preference will not apply. So if you start to think about this, there are a lot of scenarios where the price preference is simply just not going to apply. Okay, so um, we have an example here. So let's say an IFB has six line items and is awarding on the lowest total combined cost. Bidder number one has six non-US products for 200,000. Bidder number two proposes a mix, three non-US and three US products for 205. But bidder three proposes six US products for $210,000. That bidder number three is going to win because that price preference applies. That bidder number two is not able to claim the price preference because they have a mix of, of manufactured products in, U, in the U.S. and outside of the U.S. Also, if there is a tie between two bidders or offers who have both certified that they will provide products manufactured in the United States, the the, the vendor that is uh, the, that has products manufactured in Illinois shall be given a preference. So that's another drill down, another layer there. If there happens to be a tie, um, we don't see that very often, but it does it does come into play. So uh, the law has been considered that way. Also, we have a definition of manufactured in Illinois it means assembled articles, materials, or supplies that are designed, finally assembled processed, packaged, tested, or otherwise processed in Illinois in a manner that adds value, quality, or reliability. Okay, so when awarding to a bidder that successfully uses the domestic product preference, please include this notation in the notice of award. So we will have a new notice of award that will be posted shortly. Um, I'll be able to show it to you. All it is is it's just another, um, it's another checkbox when we're checking what type of procurement it is, and I, it identifies that this vendor is being awarded due to that preference. I do want to circle back. I mentioned this earlier, but I do want to circle this back a little bit and say that the vendor does have to claim the preference up front. They have to claim it at the, as a part of their quote. They're not going to be able to come back later after the award and say, oh, wait, well, I, I, I know I didn't claim this preference, but um, it would apply. So that it puts the onus a little bit more on the vendor. And um, the agency may, again, we're gonna go back and, and, and read this over a few more times, right? Um, you may ask for documentation verifying that. Okay, so that's the evaluation and award of that preference. Now, going back to the exceptions, I know we already walked through these, but these are the um, exceptions here that are, are also listed. So it's, those exceptions are listed in the templates, um, in the IFB and RFP templates, but they're also here. So if a vendor affirmatively declared when they submitted their bid that's being proposed and the agency determines to not award to that vendor, then the agency shall provide the reason for the determination. And these are all these exceptions that I just previously read. Um, and also as a part of this, um, and again, this is all, being in compliance with the law for the Domestic Products Act, um, they have added a compliance report uh, feature, not feature, uh, compliance report to, uh, to this uh, Domestic Products Act. So, provides that each purchasing agency shall submit to the Chief Procurement Officer a report on the purchase, purchasing agency's compliance with the Act, including details on any incidents of non-compliance, the purchasing agency's analysis of goods, products, and materials not subject to the act. So, if it was any of those exceptions that are listed above, 
and then also any recommendations for how to further effectuate the policy set forth in this act. So we have a new form for you for the compliance report. Um, a couple notes. Uh, the compliance report is going to be due um, to the CPOGS on June 30th of each year. Um, and then we'll be re uh, that report is going to be due on June 30th for the, the previous fiscal year um, thereafter. So the Procurement of Domestic Products Act compliance report was attached to that CPO notice. And you can find that. And I will just pull it up here very quickly. Um, I'm sure there'll be questions as, as you're completing this, um, but the first reporting period, as we're talking about dates here, it will be due on June, June 30th, but moving forward, those, the reports will start from April 1, awarded between April 1 and May 31st. And then that will go on this year's uh, fiscal year 20, 2023 compliance report. Okay, um, and so you'll just add the information here. There's a couple questions or a handful of questions here. Um, did the agency have any IFPs or RFPs where the awarded vendor offered a US manufactured product? Yes or no? If yes, then you will detail below in number in number three. Um, let's see, during the reporting period, did the agency have any IFPs where a non-awarded vendor offered a US manufactured product product? And the awarded vendor offered a non-US manufactured product that qualified for one of those exceptions. Um, so we'll we'll talk uh, we'll talk more about the the reporting piece of this. But again, it's 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 law. So we are um, going to be doing this compliance report on a yearly basis. Uh, during the reporting period, did the agency have any instances where a non-awarded vendor offered a US manufactured product? Um, and the awarded vendor offered a non-US that did not qualify for the exception. Uh, yes, if yes, then you explain why that vendor offering a non-US manufactured product was awarded. And then section two talks about the details of the procured products under those exceptions. So then that gets into the, the numbers of, of those procurements that were awarded um, either as a uh, non-US manufactured products under one of those exceptions Right, so maybe either um, you were you were awarding as uh, the total amount, and none of the vendors took the full exception in terms of all products being um, manufactured in the United States. That would fall under one of these headings. Um, but then also the number of these exceptions that are utilized. So the report is going to require us to drill down quite a bit in some of this information. So. We'll circle back on on some of um, some of this. I'm sure we will have lots of questions regarding this. We'll have further training regarding all of this, um, but it is in law, so we need to start talking about this and, and let you guys know that this is gonna um, this is gonna be needed. Okay, so I'm gonna pause on that one for right now. Right, remember we got lots of information going at you today. I recognize that. Let's go back to our slides. That takes care of the first CPO notice. All right, so now we're gonna to move to the second CPO notice, which is 2023.09. Okay, so this is regarding the solicitation templates and our disclosure forms. So these, these CPO notices kind of go together, right? So. Um, that's kind of why it all is happening at the same time, because a lot of that information that was a part of the Domestic Products Act needed to be put into the templates. And then also at the same time, law changes from the 50,000 up to 100,000. There are a lot of things that are a lot of moving parts for us right now. Um, and so we're going to talk about the new solicitation templates, new contract templates, new forms. Um, and we also have two new names. Okay. So. Forms A and Forms B. Just to reduce confusion, many times on a vendors, on the vendors, it's kind of confusing. It's a random kind of name. Forms A, Forms B. Uh, the names of those disclosure disclosure forms have changed to be more descriptive specifically about that form. Okay, so you're gonna see uh, Forms A is now called vendor disclosure. Okay, and Forms B is now called 
IPG Active Registered Vendor Disclosure. Okay, and the reason why we call it IPG Active Registered Vendor Disclosure, um, not that I'm expecting you to say that every single time. I personally, I'm probably going to say IPG Vendor Disclosure and Vendor Disclosure, but it's really important because more and more we're seeing a lot of vendors that are submitting Forms B when they're not when they don't have an active registration in IPG. So really this is, um, this is just to, to be clearer for our vendor community. Um, Cause the last thing we like to do, or you know, the last thing we wanna do is be disqualifying vendors for not submitting um, the correct form. So this is gonna aid in that. And so forms A is now called vendor disclosure. Forms B is now called IPG active registered vendor disclosure. And so that'll that'll let vendors understand more that in order to use this form, right, the old forms B, I have to be in IPG active and registered. Okay, so we'll get used to it, right? I'm, you know, uh, you'll probably still catch me calling things forms A, forms B, and that's fine. But we're, I'm going to do my best to from here henceforth call it vendor disclosure and IPG active registered vendor disclosure. Okay, so. The reasons why, um, so I, I talked about the reasons why we changed the name, um, but also uh, that that same public act 102-721 amended several sections of the Procurement of Domestic Products Act. We just talked about that and the procurement code requiring updates to the solicitation templates and those disclosure forms. So, as I mentioned earlier, the IFB, RFP, and professional artistic RFP, you know, uh, RFP PNA, initiated on or after yesterday, shall use the most updated templates and forms. Okay, so anytime we we shift templates and forms, um, I, I recognize and I understand everybody immediately thinks of, oh my gosh, I just submitted this for approval yesterday. It's making its way through its approval path, or we just posted this IFB yesterday. Do we have to go back and? change all of those those forms the answer is no if you are if you are starting a new ifb rfp rfp pna today then yeah you're gonna you're gonna go and use the new forms um, and we're gonna go out to the website and and walk through the couple of the, the changes for each one of these and just kind of highlight what what needs uh, what was changed um, but anything any ifbs rfps rfp pnas that are published uh, March 1st shall use the new template. So if you have anything that's in your queue right now that maybe is, is ready for approval, maybe it's sitting with the SPO for publishing, you can use the, the previous templates. Okay, so the templates are here, they're linked. What are the new templates that are out there? Uh, IFB, RFP, RFP PNA, the standalone contract template, the BOA over 50 and the BOA under 50. And so what I'm going to do right now is actually just jump out and just quickly highlight um, what was what was changed on that template. I think it's hiding back here. All right, so here is the IFB template. You're going to see that it looks very similar to what was there before, but some some uh, vocabulary, some vernacular uh, a couple things have have been updated so you can see uh, for instance vendor disclosure formally named forms a and you're going to see that on all of our documents um, we're not pulling the rug out from any vendor or anything like that wherever you see vendor disclosure disclosure you're going to see formally named forms a um, or ipg active registered vendor disclosure formally named forms b so those are the things that were updated for the um uh, for the template, um, a couple other things that are here as I scroll through the table of contents. The instructions, or I mean, you can all see the vendor disclosure formally named Forms A. Um, all the links have been updated. Any any reference to Forms A or Forms B has now been changed to vendor disclosure or IPG active registered vendor disclosure, kind of across the board. So templates job aids, all that sort of stuff. And we'll talk about the job aids in, in just a second. Okay, another couple of things I wanted to highlight for the IFB and RFP templates. So this instructions and general information has all been updated. 
Um, so you're not going to see the, the paper submission instructions um, on our, our new template. So you're going to see only electronic submissions through bid buy of bids and offers will be accepted. Um, a lot of this information below, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I just want to pick out a couple things that are really important. Talks about electronic submissions only are required. Um, it's going to talk about a couple other things that are specific to bid buy regarding, you know, documents need to be submitted um, in electronic format that can be accessed and read using Microsoft Office or Adobe Reader. Um, corrupted files will not be considered. It's the responsibility of the vendor to ensure the files are accessible and legible after uploading. Um, also, kind of a, a, a note to the vendors, and we, we really hope they take this to heart, is that the vendor is solely responsible for ensuring timely submission, um, you know, not allowing enough time to submit their quote before the bid opening date and time. Um, it is on their, it is the vendor's responsibility. Um, we talk about recommendations about accessing your bid by account prior to the solicitation due date and time you know, to make sure that they aren't stuck 10 minutes before an IFB is due and they're locked out of bid by or they, they, they time out due to a large file size, which we address here as well. And then we also the state encourages vendors to make sure that their bid by account is up to date. So those are the big changes. Um, for the IFB and RFP template that you're going to see, um, and hopefully it'll make things a little bit, we won't have that conflicting information regarding paper submissions and electronic submissions. Okay, so that is our IFB template. Going back to that notice, um, if you go, actually, you know what, I'm just going to go to our other uh, documents. So you have the, the IFB we talked about, RFP, same changes were there regarding uh, those changes that we made to the IFB. Uh, same with, with uh, RFP, PNA. Those are all kind of the same changes. Uh, the standalone contract template and the BOA and, and uh, under 50 and over 50. Uh, standalone contract template. So if you go out, really, it's just, I know this is a lot of new forms for you, but it also kind of makes it easier because all of the templates are new. So you know that you can all go out there and it's all new stuff. Um, which kind of makes it easier than having one change here and one change there. You know that you need to go out and, and, and grab these new forms. So you see the IFP template 23.2, RFP template 23.2, PNA RFP template 23.2. Uh, the vendor disclosure, you can see that it's, it's uh, talking about uh, formally forms A, formally forms B, uh, financial disclosures and conflicts of interest. So let's talk about that one next. Okay, so this same, the same uh, for forms A and forms B. Um, uh, actually, you know what? Let's just go to the forms A because we'll we'll just hit the the disclosure piece as a as a part of that. Um, so forms A or see, I I called forms A already. See how quickly that happens. Uh, vendor disclosure. Um, the the specific pieces that are changing for our vendor disclosure is just that it, A, it's called vendor disclosure, um, but the information regarding IDHR is not changing. The information regarding transacting business in, um, in Illinois is, has not changed. The standard Illinois certifications, you can you remember that's a, a, a change in law, so that no longer just says standard certifications, it's standard Illinois certifications. These are all listed in our vendor disclosure. Um, I know I'm scrolling through this, just this has not changed uh, this piece. So that's why I'm scrolling through it, just to identify a couple of the changes. And then we get to the uh, State Board of Elections. That has not changed. So the $50,000 um, limit um, or threshold for BOE has not changed at all. Disclosure of business operations with Iran has not changed. Then we get to financial disclosures and conflicts of interest. So. Um, the, the important changes here are, you can see that the bid offer response with an annual value of more than $100,000 is when this is going to be uh, required. So the dollar values have changed. Um, we also talk about the requirement of the disclosure of financial interest and conflicts of interest is a continuing obligation. So we're telling the vendor if something changes, 
and this disclosure that you've submitted is no longer accurate, then you must, uh, the vendor must provide an updated form. Okay, so the $100,000 has changed. Uh, the title tip page has not changed. Um, the salary, the dollar value, um, or the salary of the governor has been updated. So where we used to see that $106,000 at every point throughout all of our forms here, that's now going to say 123420 Okay, so remember as the code, the disclosure talks about 5% um, distributive income in excess of 5% or an amount greater than 60% of the annual salary of the governor. Since that salary has changed, our forms need to change. Okay, so the, the, the process, the form itself isn't really being updated much. It's just these little tweaks here and there. So the ownership share in step two has been updated for that 60% uh, of the new salary. Uh, they still need to certify. They need to check these boxes. Uh, step three isn't changing. Um, step four has not changed. Now, the one thing that I will identify that we also changed, and it comes from the, uh, we, we, we see this completed incorrectly a lot, is actually step seven, where you'll see this step must be completed for each person and entity, so that's been added, disclosed in step two. And if you recall, so going back, it's been a long time, so I think since we've talked about this on, on a training Tuesday, but the procurement code definition of person actually includes all entities and, and businesses. But we went ahead and added the and entity here just to uh, for more of a vendor instruction so that they're clear that, you know, we're not just looking for the persons disclosed in step two, if a business is, you know, part owner, you know, as, as we've all run into those scenarios where there's an, an individual that owns 20%, but then this other LLC and this other LLC own the other 80%. Um, that applies and it, and it always did apply, but at least this point, we're hoping to catch um, and, and reduce the amount of corrections that would be needed on step seven. Okay, uh, step eight hasn't changed, and step nine, this is this is all the same as well. Okay, so that is that takes care of forms A, also takes care of our uh, financial disclosures and conflicts of interest. Um, forms B, or formerly forms B, now IPG active registered vendor disclosure. It's going to look a little different. Um, Requirements for being an IPG have not changed at all. This form has changed. Um, really, it, it is to, and, and, and the updates here is really from vendors is to say, hey, stop and read this. Again, we're trying to avoid vendors completing a form, a, this IPG active registered vendor disclosure, formerly known, named Forms B, when they shouldn't be submitting it. So this is just, uh, it, it's a vendor instruction really to, to hopefully get their attention and make sure that they cannot submit this form unless they have an active registered uh, or their active registered uh, registration with the uh, IPG. Okay. So nothing else is, has changed regarding um, they still need to put in their state of Illinois registered uh, vendor registration number, their IPG expiration date um, and, you know, work through the boxes. The um, disclosure of current pending contracts has been updated to the $100,000 rather than uh, the previous amount, um, signatures and all of that. Okay, so that's forms B. Um, the updates to BOA under 50 and over 50 all have to do with the standard Illinois certifications being required above 50. Um, and so the under 50, which I'll just show you real quick. This will look familiar to you guys. There used to be this wording right along underneath here talking about uh, standard certifications that are attached. Since standard certifications are not required until $50,000, that language has been removed. Similarly, the BOA over 50, that same area that had uh, additional language that would be talking about financial disclosures has been updated. So um, 
above 50, they do need to have the standard Illinois certifications. Um, but they, they, they wouldn't need the, um, financial disclosures and conflicts of interest. Until it's 100,000 um, dollars, but if they are using, a, a a BOA, if, if you've already, if you're in the middle of one, I guess, so it kind of goes back to that same thing. If you, if you're already in the middle of one, um, you can just use the, what, what's currently, uh, what, what currently the vendor has sent to you. So if you're, you're midstream, um, on a small purchase using a BOA and you've already received the vendor signed document, go ahead and just use the, um, what you have. Okay. So now we're going to go back to our slides. And we're going to move to our third CPO notice. I know we are after our time here. So if you do need to leave, this is being recorded. It will be posted, but again, this is just, there's a lot of information to get to. Uh, so we'll go back to our CPO notice here. Um, we talked about the new disclosure forms and I kind of walked through the changes that were, uh, that were there. It all goes back to the changes in uh, procurement law. Right, so um, the the amendments it it walks through, or the CPO notice walks through the changes um, in the procurement code. We talked about the procurement code amendments um, over the last few weeks, and all of this kind of listed here. This is a summary again. So, a lot of new forms, a lot of changes, um, and so make sure that you're using our up, most up to date versions of uh, our forms moving forward. Okay, now moving on to our third CPO notice, which is 2023.10. And this refers to uh, emergency extensions, change orders, and the local food farms and jobs act or jobs act reporting. Um, again, this all has to do with changes in law. So as soon as the law changes, we need to be able to react and and change our forms and, and change processes uh, when required. You guys are resilient. We do this all the time. This feels like a lot. I recognize that, um, but that's just the way it goes sometimes, right? We just, we, we work through it and we'll have lots of questions and, and we'll, uh, we'll get you answers to those questions and those specific scenarios. But this one is gonna be regarding our emergency extensions. So what's happening with the, the new change? So section 1525, which talks about uh, the emergency extension process requires that notice of an extension of an emergency contract must be posted on bid by no later than seven, seven calendar days after the extension contract is executed. So what that means is the ex emergency extension hearing, the actual hearing, right, is no longer going to be a requirement. The emergency extension contract still absolutely has to be approved by the chief procurement officer. But what's happening is that hearing is no longer gonna uh, be a requirement. So it can be an emergency contract can be extended beyond 90 days with the approval of the chief procurement officer. Prior to execution of the extension contract, the chief procurement officer shall receive written justification for the extension. The duration of the extension shall be limited to the scope of the emergency. So we have a, a new form that's going to be rather than the emergency extension um, or emergency purchase extension hearing form. It's the emergency purchase extension approval form. And we're going to walk through that uh, in just a minute. But please submit the form at least for at least 14 days um, prior to expiration of the emergency contract. A request submitted inside of 14 days runs a greater risk of being denied uh, solely on the basis of time. So notice that says at least 14 days. So there isn't going to be, if you remember, you used to have to publicly post the emergency extension hearing date and notice at least 14 days prior to the extent of that, to the end of the emergency contract. Now, the CPO needs to have that, that form completed and signed, and we're going to walk through the form in, in just a second at least 14 days prior to expiration of the contract. It can be 21 days, it could be 30 days, right? I think kind of as a, as a best practice, many many SPOs and uh, many agency personnel, 
might be former SPOs or it, it's kind of a common practice to um, put on the calendar maybe 45 days into an emergency to say, hey, is this, are we going to need to extend this? So that way it gives you plenty of time uh, in order to, uh, to properly extend the emergency uh, contract. So at least 14 days. So again, it can be 30 days. That's even better, right? Um, but if you submit it within that 14 days, it just has a greater risk of being denied due to the, uh, the, the time nature. Okay, so before we move on to change orders, let's talk about that form. Okay, so we have the emergency purchase extension approval form. This is gonna look very, very similar to the emergency purchase extension uh, hearing form, but with a, a few tweaks and a lot of the information that might be gleaned from uh, the, the hearing is gonna need to be in the form because um, the CPO still needs the information in order to approve um, or change the, the length or duration of the emergency extension. So the, the first part all looks the same, right? The requesting agency, address, vendor, <clears throat> all that sort of stuff. Extension justification, okay? So you're gonna put the original emergency term start date. All of this is, has, has not been changed. This is the original emergency term end date, the amount of the original emergency contract, was it estimated or actual? the expected ex extension start date, the expe expected extension end date, the amount, um, and whether that's actual or estimated. Okay, a couple new things that have been added. Is there BEP participation on this contract? There's a drop down. If yes, please detail. If no, explain why. That is a, uh, a procurement or a procurement code requirement um, that uh, BEP, and, and you can read the specific portion of it, um, that uh, BEP vendors are encouraged to be included on emergency contracts. Okay, this next section here is if, if the emergency extension is being, if you're being asked to extend the extension, right? So um, we are already capturing the original emergency information right here. So if you are just extending one emergency, this section right here will just stay blank. However, if you need to extend an extension, this is where you're gonna capture that information. Okay, so don't put the information for the original emergency here. This is just if you had already done one extension and now you're coming back to ask for another extension, okay? Then we get into the questions. This is pretty straightforward stuff, but it's really, really important. So um, the, the less back and forth between the agency and the SPO regarding this information, the better. So more information, the better regarding these questions. So providing detail about the events that led the agency to conduct an emergency procurement in the first place. Um, this is all information that the CPO needs in order to be able to approve uh, the extension. What is the scope of the work of, uh, what is the scope of work of the initial emergency contract? Um, does this extension change the scope of work? Um, I, I would think most of the time we're gonna see that as no, um, but if it is changing the scope of work, that needs to be explained here. You know, get into detail here of what this is, this is about. Um, again, this is not just replacing the hearing, but it, it's all information that is required by the CPO. So if you can put this information up front and, and really think about what these questions are asking, um, it's gonna make the process just that much easier. And then provide justification for extending the original um, emergency contract. So, you know, what, what's the reason why this is uh, being extended or at, what you're asking for the extension? Um, the top, you can see, once you complete, it at, complete this information at the top, it auto fills the, the rest of the way. Um, question number five, does this emergency contract correct or eliminate the emergency condition, yes or no? So sometimes the emergency extension, maybe or uh, the emergency contract eliminates that emergency condition. So I'm thinking about 
replacing a boiler or a chiller or something like that. Well, once you have that information in, maybe maybe the uh, you know for this extension, uh, the the boiler wasn't fabricated in time, but they're working on it, right? Something like that. That could be the the type of scenario where it's eliminating the emergency condition. Uh, but th th this is dif differentiating differentiating between those per those extensions that are um, you know the scenario of where the extension is going to eliminate the emergency condition versus like an ongoing need for some of those emergency extension contracts. And then also explain why the need cannot be met through a competitive procurement process. Again, we're explaining this is this is information that if it's an emergency, we need to justify why that's emergency. Why 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 is the state giving this one vendor this contract, right? Not to get too informal about it, but that's really what we're talking about here, right? It's good to think about the the, the why behind all of these fields and, and these forms is because we're not, this contract is not the product of a competitively uh, bid procurement. So why is that? Um, in set, number seven, is a competitive procurement in process? And then what's the status? Um, so we see that that's, that's a common option as well. You know, we, we have this need, it's we, for whatever number of reasons, um, we don't have another contract in place, but we published that IFB or it's under that RFP is under evaluation, or we just awarded it last week on this date, but the contract hasn't been executed. Those sorts of things. So those are the types of scenarios that we're that we're looking for in this form. And then what's the effect if the extension uh, was to be denied? Okay, scrolling down a little bit more to our third page. Where the signatures are, um, oh, too far there. Um, so the APO needs to sign this form. Okay, not a designee. This has to be the agency procurement officer. The SPO is also going to need to to sign, saying that they have read through and then they recognize this and they and and they're uh, they, they're going to sign this. And then the CPO signs at the bottom, whether. Uh, you know, two different options here, and and this isn't new, but as a part of that hearing, this this would have been um, brought up in terms of um, approving proceeding in accordance with the emergency contract extension detailed in this document, or um, I approve, but with the following changes, right? So maybe maybe the the agency asked for a year long extension, and the CPO says, I, okay, I approve the extension, but it's going to be you know nine months or six months or or whatever. So that that is uh, a, a part of the form as well. So be aware of that. But the big key takeaway here is the CPO does, even though the hearing is not occurring, the CPO still has to approve before that contract can be executed for the extension. Okay. Okay. All right. You still with us? Everybody's head blown up yet? A lot of information. Uh, let's go back to our other CPO notice. And we're almost done here. Thanks for sticking with me. Let's see. The last portion here is regarding the change orders. Okay, so the, the definition of a change order has changed from $10,000 to $25,000. And the total number of days from 30 to 180. So, um, you're, you're going to see that reflected on the change order notice form. You're going to see that uh, reflected on the change order uh, job aid where we have the definition. So it's just that that definition of a change order has changed. So now if it's not 10,000, it's $25,000. So if the amendment increases the total dollar amount to $25,000, now that's a change order. And then also if you are increasing or decreasing the contract 100, by 180 days, uh, that would be a change order. Okay. Also, the Local Food, Farms, and Jobs Act reporting. So, Local Food, Farms, and Jobs Act establishes the goal that 20% of all food and food products uh, shall be local farm or food products. So, there's going to be a reporting component to this that um, 
is going to publish on bid buy on January 1st and each January 1st thereafter. Um, it's just going to be a, a, um, a general notice, but on the local food and uh, local farm or food products that were from the previous fiscal year. Okay, so remember the Domestic Products Act is going to be due. That report is going to be due on June 30th of each month or of each year. The Local Food Farms and Jobs Act reporting will be January 1, but still for the previous fiscal year. And so you will use uh, do a general notice that is going to include the total dollar value of food and food products purchased in fiscal year 2023 and the total value of local farm or food products purchased in fiscal year 2023. Okay, so we'll go back to my slides here. I wanna highlight just a couple things that are, I kind of mentioned this before, but the bid by job aids that were affected by those three CPO notices and by the procurement law that, the, that was updated, IFB, RFP, material change order, uh, the contract change order, and also the contract change order to a small purchase. So that that change order definition changing um, on a small purchase probably just means that we're going to see even less change orders on a small purchase because that's going to have to be $25,000 before it's a change order on a small purchase. Um, also, emergency extension, job aid will be updated, and the renewal. So what's changing on each each one of these? Rather than going through every single one, just because I've thrown a lot of information at you, we will circle back and hit some of these probably next week, but I at least wanted to show you what's changing. So really the, bi the big change on all of these, um, other than the emergency extension would be forms A and forms B have now been changed to vendor disclosure and IPG active registered vendor disclosure. Th that's really it. So you're gonna see that those have changed, you know, rather than putting blank forms A, if this is a screenshot from the IFB template, uh, rather than saying blank forms A, you're going to attach blank vendor disclosure, right? Rather than a blank forms B, it's going to be called IPG active registered vendor disclosure. Um, also, in the, re, uh, the required attachments portion, that name change has been indicated here um, for our vendors and uh, so pretty straightforward in terms of a lot of the job aid changes. Um, however, they will all need to be changed. So they haven't been posted yet. They're queued up, ready to go. I'm going to post them right after our, our meeting here. And so you'll see that. Um, the definition of change order, which was at the top of those uh, two change order job aids, has been updated. The process has not at all. It's purely just the the $25,000 change um, and the 180 days or more. Okay, also uh, tomorrow we have our monthly bid by training. Uh, no registration necessary, join us. This is the, we always offer this the second Wednesday of each month. We have those four different sessions and uh, please feel free to join us. Uh, where do we find our bid by training opportunities? That's always a slide that we always have in there. Um, and I just wanted to kind of as, as, as we're finishing up here, I know I've said it a few times, I just want to reiterate, we recognize that this is a lot of information. As you are reading through those CPO notices once, twice, three times, you know, collect those questions, reach out to me, reach out to your SPO and, um, We'll, we'll make sure that those get answered. It is a lot of information. The second time I read it, it clicked for me. The third time I read those, it even made more sense. Um, so I, I felt like the, the quote of the day, life is about change. Sometimes you just have to roll with the punches. That is perfect for today. <laughs> um, and uh, I, sorry, there's there were a, a couple other questions in here. Uh, we don't have an RFQ form. Um, be, due to the the flexibility on every agency kind of has a, a different form that they might use for those small purchases. Um, if you reach out to me separately, I could probably track down something for you, but it, it, we do not have a specific template for small purchases. Um, you know what? And then 
I, I was going to put it in here, but let's just go ahead and I'm going to end up with a, a dad joke here <laughs> because uh, my son told me this yesterday and let's just end on a laugh. So uh, what did he say? What do you cross? What do you get when you cross an elephant and a rhinoceros? Elephino. Put him. All right. Thanks, everybody. Uh, we will talk soon. We will dig into this a little bit more and uh, have a great rest of your week and we'll see you soon.